you actually had a meeting with Larry Hoover. Okay. Tell me about how this meeting came together. Larry Hoover, who was locked up at the time in Joliet, wanted to meet with me and wanted to meet with me and my partner, actually. Have you ever wondered about the real-life villains and heroes of the streets? Well, let me tell you about Larry Hoover, the toughest and most fascinating gangster Chicago has ever seen. Picture this. Larry Hoover grew up in the tough streets of Chicago, where life was anything but easy. But Larry didn't let that stop him. He rose up to become the ultimate boss, known by many as the last true gangster of Chicago. Hoover allegedly orders the execution of William Pookie Young for robbing one of his narcotics houses. Imagine a world where the streets are ruled by gangs, where danger lurks around every corner. That was Larry's reality, growing up in the rough neighborhoods of Chicago. Instead of succumbing to the temptations of crime, Larry decided to take control of his life. Through sheer determination and cunning, he built an empire that shook the foundations of the city. But with power came enemies, and Larry found himself in a constant battle to protect what he had built. As we delve into the life of Larry Hoover, from his humble beginnings to his reign as the last true gangster of Chicago. Discover the highs and lows of his journey, the alliances forged and broken, and the legacy he leaves behind. Larry Hoover's story isn't just a tale of crime. It's a testament to the human spirit and the resilience of the human soul. So buckle up and get ready for a roller coaster ride through the life and story of Larry Hoover a true legend of Chicago. Hoover, also known as King Larry, was born in Jackson, Mississippi in 1950. At the young age of four-year-old, his parents moved the family to Chicago, Illinois. By 13, Larry was already running the streets with a gang called the Supreme Gangsters. The crew was known for local muggings and theft before evolving into assaults and shootings. Hoover would quickly move up the ranks and in the late 60s he was in complete control of the gang, changing their name to the Gangster Disciples. Do you know who Larry Hoover is? He's a person who grew up in a tough place called Chicago. His life wasn't easy. Larry was born in Mississippi in 1950, but moved to Chicago when he was young. Growing up he faced a lot of problems, like not having enough money and seeing violence all around him. This made him feel like he had to join a gang to stay safe and belong somewhere. Living in Chicago wasn't easy for Larry. He didn't have a lot of money and neither did his family. They struggled to pay for things they needed. This made Larry feel sad and hopeless, like he didn't have much of a future. Larry didn't have a dad around to teach him things or to show him what's right and wrong. This made him look for guidance from others and he found it in a gang. Gangs seemed like a family to him, a group of people who understood him and accepted him, even if what they were doing wasn't good. The place where Larry grew up was filled with gangs, and one of the biggest ones was called the Gangster Disciples. Larry, along with his friend David Barksdale, started this gang. They wanted to protect their neighborhood and fight against the unfair things happening to them and other African American people. But as they got stronger, they also started doing bad things like selling drugs and hurting people. The Gangster Disciple Nation, often abbreviated as the GDs, formerly GDN, also known as Growth and Development, is an African-American street and prison gang which was formed in 1968 by Larry Hoover and David Barksdale. The two rival gangsters united together to form the Black Gangster Disciple Nation, BGDN. Since 1989, after a decline in leadership caused friction between the two gangs, the BGDN has divided into different factions known today as the Gangster Disciple Nation and the other being the Black Disciple Nation. Back in the 1960s, when Larry was young, things were really hard for African American people. They faced a lot of racism and didn't have many opportunities to succeed. Larry saw this and wanted to change it. He thought joining a gang was the only way to make a difference, even if it meant doing illegal things. The origins of the Gangster Disciples began in Englewood on the south side of Chicago, Illinois, in 1964, when 13-year-old Larry the King Hoover 
joined a small street gang called the Supreme Gangsters. For years, the Supreme Gangsters had an outstanding war with the Black Disciples Nation, led by David Barksdale. In 1969, Hoover and Barksdale agreed to a ceasefire. This resulted in the creation of the Black Gangster Disciple Nation. By the early 1970s, the BGDN dominated the Chicago gang scene. Barksdale died of kidney failure in 1974 at the age of 27. Following his death, Hoover assumed full control of the Black Gangster Disciples. In 1978, the BGDN began to splinter into three distinct factions, Black Gangsters, Black Disciples, and Gangster Disciples. However, Hoover, at the time incarcerated on M charges, prevented it by quickly setting up an alliance of all street and prison gangs in his interest into one family. The alliance consisted of Gangster Disciples, Black Disciples, Satan Disciples, Latin Disciples, Spanish Gangster Disciples, Ambrose, Two Two Boys, Two Sixers, Two Six Boys, Simon City Royals, North Side Insane Popes, La Raza, Spanish Cobras, Imperial Gangsters, Harrison Gents, and the Latin Eagles. During Hoover's heyday in certain areas of Chicago, particularly in the business realm, a grim reality prevailed. Business owners were subject to extortion taxes, a practice long associated with the Italian Mafia. This tax, still prevalent today, was a significant revenue stream for organized crime. In parallel, in black neighborhoods, this extortion took a different form, primarily driven by drug-related activities orchestrated by black gangs. The gangster disciplines are active in over 100 cities and 50 states, predominantly in the Midwestern and Southeastern United States, and remnants also maintain a significant presence in the U.S. prison system. The gang had between approximately 50,000 and 90,000 members. The gang had expanded through the north and west sides of Chicago, as well as Indianapolis, Minneapolis, Kansas City, Detroit, Milwaukee, Cincinnati, Birmingham, Hattiesburg, and co-founder Hoover's birthplace of Jackson. They first emerged in significant numbers in Memphis, Tennessee in the 1980s, the first modern street gang to do so. The gangster disciples were implicated in the 2008 M's of member Cecil Dotson Sr., his fiancée, Marissa Williams, fellow member Hollis Seals, and his girlfriend, Shindri Robertson. Also, Ked were Cecil and Marissa's four-year-old son, Samario, and Cecil's son with Erica Smith, two-year-old Cecil Dotson II. The toddler had been spending the night with his father and siblings. Severely injured in the attack were Cecil and Marissa's other three children, nine-year-old Cecil Dotson Jr., five-year-old Cedric, and two-month-old Senia. Allegations were originally made that the gangster disciples were responsible for the event which came to be known as the Leicester Street Massacre and was featured in two separate episodes of the first 48 on A&E. Cecil and his family were butchered by Dotson's own brother, Jesse, who eventually confessed to the Kings. He was convicted on all counts and sentenced to six death sentences plus 120 years for the three children, his niece and nephews, that he attempted to K. The gangster disciples were cleared of any involvement. On July 3, 2005, men claiming to be members of the gangster disciples street gang K. Ed Sergeant Juwan Johnson of the U.S. Army in the small town of Hohenecken, part of the city of Kaiserslautern, near Ramstein, Germany. Prosecutors accused U.S. Air Force senior airman Rico Williams of being the first one to start attacking Johnson in a six-minute beating that he had to endure to join the gang. After the beating, Johnson asked one of his fellow gang members to take him to the hospital. Williams then ordered his gang members not to take him there. Johnson later died from multiple blunt force trauma injuries. According to the government's investigations, Williams was the leader of the gang set operating on base. Senior Airman Williams was sentenced to 22 years in prison, while other servicemen faced sentences ranging from 2 to 12 years. Some of the charges against the servicemen were Williams, second degree M, and witness tampering. Air Force Staff Sergeant Jerome Jones, 
conspiracy to commit assault, gang participation, and other charges. Airman Nicholas Sims and Army Sergeant Rodney Howell, involuntary manslaughter. Private Terence Norman, voluntary manslaughter. On July 21, 2020, a car pulled up to a funeral home in Chicago's Englewood area, and two gunmen infiltrated the property, opening fire. Fifteen people were wounded, with no reported fatalities. The funeral was for a victim, Ked, a week prior, and was allegedly involving a dispute between two gangster disciples' factions. In 1989, Hoover's attention of the black gangster disciples began to die down as he focused solely on the gangster disciples, enraging parts of the BGDN subsets and the folk nation. Members of the Black Disciples decided to split from the Black Gangster Disciples, resulting in the reinvention of the original gang name and the incorporation of the new Gangster Disciples. Other members who felt disrespected by Hoover's declining orders decided to get his attention again by instigating gang-related shootings toward the new GDs. Two noted shootings that related to the dispute between the two Disciple gangs was a drug-related shooting that K-Ed, some members of the Gangster Disciples, and the 1991 Revenge M of Black Disciple leader Mickey Bull Johnson. In 1997, several indictments marked the beginning of what law enforcement officials predict will be a long battle to completely dismantle the notorious Chicago-based prison gang, the Gangster Disciples. For the past 25 years, the reputed leader of the organization, Larry Hoover, had run the 30,000-member militaristic gang and its drug trade from Joliet State Prison in Illinois. Larry Hoover ran the Gangster Disciples from within Joliet State Prison. Hoover was serving a 200-year sentence for a 1973 gang-related M. The gang had been selling about two kilograms of coke per week for the past five years. Finally, the five-year undercover investigation by the federal government led to drug conspiracy, extortion, and other criminal charges against Larry Hoover and other high-ranking members of the street gang. The narrative traces back to the early 1970s, when Larry Hoover, the central figure in the gangster disciples' GD street gang, gained control from within prison walls. His influence extended through various correctional facilities, with key lieutenants executing his orders on the outside. Gregory Shorty G. Shell emerged as Hoover's main enforcer, operating from Junie's Shrimp, a seafood joint that doubled as a base for gang activities. Hoover's empire began to crumble in 1994, with the unraveling of Operation Headache by the Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA. Wiretap evidence revealed damning discussions, including Hoover's push for a formalized street tax on drug sales, with violence as a means of enforcement if necessary. The operation's success was aided by informants within the gang's ranks, including Charles Jello Bates and Daryl D. Blount Johnson. However, their cooperation led to their demise as they were executed to eliminate loose ends. Additionally, Hoover's sophisticated network included moles feeding information to him, including Shell's lover, a Chicago policewoman. As the pressure mounted, internal strife within the gang escalated, resulting in M contracts placed on informants. Ultimately, Johnson fell victim to such a contract while Banks, another informant, met a similar fate. These events marked the downfall of Hoover's reign as law enforcement efforts culminated in his indictment and conviction, ensuring he would never see freedom again. Hoover and six associates were found guilty of these charges, and Hoover was transferred to a federal prison in Terre Haute, Indiana. Hoover's incarceration in the federal prison is expected to seriously disable the Gangster Disciples Gang. On April 27, 2016, 32 members of Gangster Disciples were arrested on RICO charges by federal agents. Among the 32 arrested was a former Atlanta area police officer who prosecutors say was a hitman for the gang. The indictment alleges that Gangster Disciples members committed 10 M's, 12 attempted M's, two robberies, the extortion of rap artists to force the artists to become affiliated with the Gangster Disciples, and fraud resulting in losses of over $450,000. In 
In addition, the gangster disciples moved large amounts of H-substance, C-substance, methamphetamine, illegal prescription drugs, and marijuana. The indictment also sought forfeiture of 34 different firearms seized as part of the investigation. For decades, Larry Hoover's imprisonment has been surrounded by controversy and debate. Some argue that Hoover has been able to maintain control of the gang from behind bars using intermediaries to communicate with members on the outside. Others believe that Hoover has been unfairly targeted by law enforcement and that his imprisonment is a violation of his civil rights. The debate over Hoover's imprisonment has also been influenced by his reputation in pop culture as a charismatic and influential leader, with some seeing him as a Robin Hood figure who used his power to benefit his community. Regardless of one's perspective, the controversy and debate surrounding Larry Hoover's imprisonment highlight the complex and nuanced nature of gang activity and the criminal justice system. While Larry Hoover's imprisonment has been a significant event in the history of Chicago's gang activity, the impact of his incarceration on the community is so gray. Some argue that Hoover's incarceration has had a positive impact on the community by reducing the level of violence and criminal activity associated with the gangster disciples. Words on the street is that his continued influence over the gang, even from prison, has perpetuated a cycle of violence and crime in Chicago, as well as other communities around the country. Experts also believe that the incarceration of such a high-profile gang leader can have a disruptive effect on the gang's structure and hierarchy, leading to increased violence as rival factions compete for power. The impact of Larry Hoover's incarceration on the Chicago community is complex and multifaceted and requires a nuanced understanding of the dynamics of street gangs in America. Over the years, there has been a concerted effort by advocates and celebrities to try to get Larry Hoover freed from prison. Some believe Hoover's trial and sentencing were flawed and that he has been denied a fair re-evaluation of his case. They also claim he has also been a model prisoner since his incarceration. In 2021, Kanye West and Drake joined forces for a concert in support of the release of Larry Hoover. The Amazon-sponsored concert, which was held at the LA Coliseum in Los Angeles, California on December 9th, was orchestrated by Jay Prince, who encouraged a reunion between the two feuding rappers. Hoover has previously asked the courts to reduce his life sentence under the First Step Act, which allows people who have been convicted of crack coke offenses to challenge their sentences, but a judge denied the request last year. In letters written by Hoover, he expressed remorse for his actions, but will still have to pay the price for them. I have long since renounced my association with any and all criminal organizations and their membership, Hoover wrote. I am no longer a member, leader, or even an elder statesman of the Gangster Disciples. I want nothing to do with it now and forever. And that's all for today. Until next time, peace out.